So welcome to part two of our special series with Joseph Henrich. Um, Joe is the Ruth Moore Professor of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. He is the author of several books, most recently two widely read popular books, The Weirdest People in the World and The Secret of Our Success. He has had a unique career trajectory in having been a professor across multiple disciplines, anthropology, economics, psychology, and human evolutionary biology. Thank you again for joining us, uh, Joe, in, in this series. I wonder right now at the very start that we briefly just summarize in part one, we kind of, we just sort of, in short, it was like humans are the cultural species. Um, and in part two today, we're going to look more at like, what does cultural evolution look like? But just in a nutshell, what can we summarize part one for us? That what does it mean for humans to be the cultural species? Yeah, I mean, the key idea that, uh, I mean, the secret of our success focuses on humans as a cultural species is that more than any other species, we've uh, evolved genetically to learn from each other uh, and rely on acquiring this vast body of cultural knowledge from other members of our social group. And in particular, humans' culture is cumulative. So over generations, it aggregates. And this is what led to the process of us relying so heavily on learning from others. So rather than distinguishing you know, cultural explanation, explanations from genetic explanations, once you have this idea, you can think of cultural explanations as a kind of evolutionary explanation, which rests on our genetically evolved capacities for learning from each other. And then there's all kinds of interesting ways that culture can evolve to help us understand cooperation and the origins of religion and why psychology varies across societies once you have that basic framework. Perfect. So today, let's start out It's to say, so if we have this metaphor last time, maybe just for myself and listeners. So if you like the, the bad but useful like hardware software distinction that we might have if there's this kind of our brain, our brain is changed, unlike, you know, normal computer by the software we're running, which is you might say is culture, the learned things we acquire uh, from us. You know, to put, you know, to put it simply, you know, I, I work out how to fish with a harpoon or I work out how to use a, a phone, an iPhone. I, I don't work that out on my own. I work, learn it from others. That learning is, is kind of culturally transmitted. And what we just said is we have evolved a species to be specifically good at acquiring and transmitting that, working out who to learn from, et cetera. So let's now come to kind of cultural evolution. What would, what I mean, in the simplest way, what, tell me what do we mean by cultural evolution? Yeah, I mean, the core idea is that you want to think about humans as populations of learners. So, you know, one of the things that, that's impressive about humans as infants is that we come into the world and rapidly begin, begin learning stuff from other members of our social group. And, you know, by age one, children are beginning to learn language and acquire all kinds of other things. But then it looks like we have an extended childhood uh, that allows us to, you know, spend a lot of time learning, acquiring social norms in middle childhood and whatnot. So, I mean, that's a core element of cultural evolution. Then the, the cultural part comes from the fact that you have a group of individual learners all acquiring from each other over several generations. And that's at the core. Now, there's lots of interesting higher level things. So in cultural evolution, different groups can end up with different social norms. And then the norms can evolve according to how they influence the competition among groups. But let's, let's start even then with the simplest thing if I would kind of explain this as it were to, you know, my, my, I don't know, my mother is like the simplest, let's say I have some way of making, I don't know, a spear and you, what we mean just to really make it conquer, what does cultural evolution mean? Like I've got a, you know, I've got some tool artifact or some other thing, or even a norm. Can you give a concrete example of, of cultural evolution or improvement that we might know about, or, or even this kind of example made up? Well, I mean, just that the idea that you're learning how to make a spear or how to use a computer from other members of your social group. Um, and you might be learning from multiple models. So what you actually end up doing is not anything that exactly everyone else is doing, but it's some mixture and modification of the different things you've learned from other people. I mean, that's the kind of thing we have in mind. So it could be techniques, it could be the materials you use, uh, that kind of thing. 
Okay, and do we have an example from the historical record where we could trace this kind of evolution in something like a like a tool use? Like we we can see it now in the lab. You know, people modify and improve something, and then it passes on to the next generation. There's some kind of selection going on in this metaphor. I mean, there's a there's a few different uh, ways of looking at that. One is, as you mentioned, there's laboratory studies where you can study the evolution of how people make spaghetti towers or how they make knots or things like that, where you have the accumulation of techniques over time that get better and better at solving some experimental problem. It could be lifting a chair or, or making the spaghetti tower as high as you want it. Um, there's also historical examples where you can trace the the steam engine or the light bulb or something like that through time. So you have many, many different instantiations and you can see how different bits were added to gradually improve things over time and then figure out where those bits came from. Okay. And so the thing also that you emphasize is while the most visible examples there are things that are almost technologies, some of the most interesting examples are also about social norms. And that really brings us to maybe the weirdest people in the world as a good example, because that that really was uh, a package of of cultural norms that were evolving over time. Is that would that be the way that you would put it? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a that's a good way to put it. So um, social norms, like just to think about religion or something. You can often track different elements of a religious package that a community might have uh, across space and time. So a lot of them will go back to previous generations, but then each generation might add new stuff, different rituals, different taboos. Uh, different interpretations of religious texts, things like that. So, um, I mean, in the case of trying to explain the psychological peculiarity of European populations, so this idea that European populations are weird, so they're Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, but also psychologically peculiar. I mean, I, I've tried to trace that to Christianity in particular, to the particular set of um, family practices, forms of social organization, taboos uh, that really were developed in late antiquity in one particular branch of Christianity, the one that led to the Catholic Church. Okay, so let's wind up just for a second and say, what, what just for listeners, what is weird? What, what, is, what do you mean when you say the term weird? And yeah, let, what, and what are the kind of psychological features in a bit of detail that distinguishes that group? Yeah, so the, I think the main thing to remember about the WEIRD acronym is that it was, it's a consciousness-raising device. And yeah. so methodologically, some colleagues and I, starting around 2005, began to review this literature in psychology. And what we found is that um, most of the participants that psychologists and experimental economists and others were using at that time uh, came from this psychologically peculiar population. So psychologists were relying heavily on American undergraduates. And, even if, you, if people got really exotic, they would you know, get participants from the US and the UK or something like that, or also Swiss participants or something. Um, and, the, and what we found is that whenever we had data that would allow us to seat those populations in a more global distribution, they were often uh, unusual. So they would ride the end of the, the tail of the distribution or just out, be outliers in some way. Not always, but often. Uh, so as a consciousness raising device, we dub these populations weird, which is an acronym standing for Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. And it was meant to remind uh, researchers mostly to to consider their subject pools and to be cautious about generalizations and, you know, hopefully to encourage people to study cultural diversity and try to explain the variation among populations. But then that always left me with this puzzle, which how, uh, you know, there was still this set of unusual, psychologically unusual populations. So how can we explain why those populations are unusual psychologically? What is it about them? And so following on work by other anthropologists and historians, I pursued this idea that it may lie in the structure of families. And there was, you know, Europeans are, uh, it's well established that they have these unusually simple families. So monogamous nuclear families, relatively unimportant extended relatives compared to other societies, no clans, no cousin marriage, things like that. So then the question is, where did, when did European societies become like that? And that leads in, into the historical record. And that's where I think Christianity plays a role. And just to ask again, so 
What is different, let's say, about Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic? I mean, I'm just quoting from your book here. Suppose something happened historically that made people less conforming, less obedient, less willing to defer to elders, traditional authorities, and ancient sages. So what are the other, what are these psychological features that are distinct or that make them outliers when you look at them in a kind of global sense psychologically? Could you mention some of the key features you notice? Yeah. So, I mean, one is the individualism complex. So this tendency to focus on the self and to distinguish the self in sharp ways from others. Um, This tends to be associated with overconfidence and self-enhancement, the experience of the emotion of guilt over shame, um, and kind of what psychologists call an individualized self-concept, which is just uh, thinking about the self in terms of dispositional characteristics, um, trying to cultivate those characteristics. And then another area is impersonal psychology, so trust and cooperation with strangers, which you can measure a bunch of different ways, but It basically comes out to how you engage with strangers versus your own more social in-groups, whether that be your family or ethnic group, um, country, something like that. And uh, another one is analytic thinking. So psychologists have long distinguished uh, people who focus more on problems and break, break problems down into component objects and view those components of the problem with, with uh, characteristics and then try to explain systems via that basis versus a more holistic way of thinking where you focus on the relationships between objects or people and try to explain things based on the relationships or the background context or whatnot. So just to give you a simple example of analytic thinking, you know, when physicists have traditionally approached a problem, they assign properties to objects. It could be uh, gravity to planets. It could be charge to particles. It could be spin to particles, something like that. And then everything else follows from that. Psychologists assign personalities. And then once you've assigned people these dispositional personality traits, then you're going to explain behavior instead of focusing on the relationship or the context or things like that. There's even something called the fundamental attribution error, which is something that's really strong in Western subjects, which is this tendency to focus on imputed attributes to the person. So if they fall down, they're, um, they're clumsy, or if, they're, if they show up late to work, they're lazy or something like that, rather than like, you know, got a flat tire or there was water on the floor would be non-dispositional ways of explaining that. Um, so that's been something that's been recognized in Western subjects, but it doesn't, it appears weaker or not at all in, in other populations. But you can see that kind of imbuing the science to a degree. Um, so. so there are this cluster of psychological factors that show up a lot more strongly in Western weird populations. Um, and the question was, what what caused this? You know, as you say, it also was even novel to see this for a time. It was just these were this was psychology. P- fundamental attribution error was a feature of all humans. In fact, it turns out it's not. So that's that's breakthrough one. I get that. But what's really then we're going to say is that I think is I just want to pause for myself and also remind myself is what's dramatic here is that cultural evolution you know we all kind of get oh yeah you know like the iphone iterated or the, the steam engine or some ha- axe you know we've gone to the museum and seen like there was an axe like this and then it was chipped in a different way and a different kind of stone axe but we're talking really about like deep psychological predispositions like to see the world analytically or more as holistically or to conform or not conform or to you know in other significant quite profound psychological ways actually aren't universal and are also you're gonna you're suggesting are a product of cultural evolution or the influence of cultural evolution on our psyche like in a kind of i guess it's just a dance here there's our underlying genetics set up but there's also kind of our on our kind of being individually but culture is the kind of network in which we swim of 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 artifacts yeah. and, and, and part of the key idea that we talked about last time is that because we're a cultural species a lot of our evolution has t- taken place in a world with cultural norms and institutions and locally evolved technologies and particular ways of communication different languages and uh, i mean part of the plasticity of our minds is that we we need to adapt to be able to navigate those different cultural worlds so you know, we're adapting psychologically to be able to better navigate these different worlds. And they're composed of, you know, roughly technologies and institutions and languages. And so 
the key idea that, uh, that I focused on at the beginning of the uh, trying to explain this, these patterns of psychology is to focus on the most fundamental of human institutions, which is the organization of the family. Now, that doesn't mean that other institutions aren't also important, and I think they're part of the story. But in, in the account that I lay out, and I still think this is the case, the family is kind of the first thing to shift, which then leads to a lot of downstream consequences all the way eventually leading to things like representative democracy and whatnot, but that's downstream from the shifts in the family size and structure. So let's, now we've established that there are these norm, um, sorry, there are these major psychological potentially changes as a result of culture that, well, that's what we're going to come to. What are what is that story of cultural evolution and and kind of psychological change? Do you want to set that out to us? You know, where does it begin? Yeah, well, so if you're thinking, if you're if you're if, if the question is where does the kind of process leading to weird psychology begin, the yes. place where I start it at is this particular set of taboos and rules about family structures that one branch of Christianity adopted beginning in late antiquity. And you can see the first signs of this by um, taboos placed by the church on uh, leveret marriage. So in lots of societies, when, you're, um, when, when your wife's, if your wife dies, you might marry the sister. And so that's a common practice. You know, if the sister is unmarried, you would marry the sister. And so the church taboos that. And then they, then they taboo marriage to first cousins. And eventually that becomes second cousins. And of course, the church taboos polygyny. So you can only have one spouse at a time. So there are all these rules uh, about marriage and the family that gradually accrete and actually get pretty strong by ninth, 10th century. And the church backs off some of the cousin marriage stuff uh, after the year 1000. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a lot of these stuff has already been done and it doesn't back off of it too much. You don't get the disappearance of explicit religious taboos until the Protestant Reformation. So you have this, this push that the church does to break people down into monogamous nuclear families. And then trying to navigate a world where you don't have these extended clans and big kinship networks is the world that I'm thinking about adapting to you where you have to cultivate individual attributes and you need to find people who to be, you know, business partners and engage in self-insurance and mates and friends and all that kind of stuff based on these internalized attributes. So people need to begin cultivating things that'll be of interest to other people. And then of course they're looking for people with those traits because they can't rely on this extensive set of kin ties, which is another way of guaranteeing trust and honesty and things like that. So that, that's the shift that I see occurring. So one question to rise at. So how do you keep saying kin, like the alternative is kinship networks. To say a bit about it, so what, how are most societies other than weird organized? Like, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that. an, that's an important point is that if you look at the anthropological record across human societies, you know, there's lots of interesting uh, variation in kinship and the structure of families. But compared to the West, the, they all look pretty intensive in the sense that people rely heavily. So the unit of production is some set of family members and family member guides distribution. They're often in the residence of the, 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 the core of any kind of legal structure. So rather than being uh, having individual rights, which is that's why individual rights is such a unique thing in the West, uh, you know, you'd be represented by some kind of kin network and you'd be dependent on usually some kind of you know, patriarchal male would be in charge of everybody in some sort of clan-like structure. This is how it was in Rome. It's how it was in China, um, lots of other places. So, uh, you know, you see it in the politics and the law and economic production, the family is really the core, not the individual. And then there are various ways of tying kinship together. There are matrilineal societies and patrilineal societies. Most societies had polygyny. Most societies had cousin marriage. Most societies had rules about where couples would live after they get married. They wouldn't set up their own residence. They'd live either with the bride's family or the groom's family, things like that. So all this helped to, to make the family the core of political, economic, and social life. Right, the family or the extended family, the clan. Right. So, so just, just walk it through just one example. Like, Why does polygyny or cousin marriage important to maintaining clan structure or family structure? Just, 
Just yeah, spell that out. The way to think about it is, is about net. I think the way to think about it is about kin net or about networks, right? And, um, you know, everybody's born and they inherit some set of relatives. And what cousin marriage does is it is it rebonds families together. So if you have a marriage between two kin groups, say two clans. Well, well imagine you and I, imagine we're somehow, we're in some extended network. You know, there's Joe and Rufus and I don't know, your marriage, I don't know, what would cousin marriage be like? Yeah, I don't know, but like, what, how would it work? Like, we were somehow part of, we were like distant cousins. What would happen now? Why is cousin marriage important if you can marry, you know, I don't know, my my sister who's your distant cousin? Right. Well, because what that does is it creates a bond between the two families. And it means that both members of those two families now have relatives in the other family. And right. So, and those relatives are suddenly closer, right? The products of that union are going to be more closely related than, than anybody else's. So you sort of pull the families closer together. And this, you know, it's taking advantage of our genetic inclination to help close relatives. But then there's also a bunch of social rules and requirements laid on top of that. In terms of monetary exchanges that go on, uh, rules about having to defend each other, um, things like that. So, you know, in lots of societies, if someone in your clan was murdered and we were related through this cousin marriage, then we've got to all step up and support you guys. Uh, got it. With that problem. So as I think it through, basically, imagine we're, you know, I'm not even, I don't know, I guess it's my wife is somehow distantly related to you. Uh well, like, well, I'm distant. Let's say I'm di I'm distantly related to you, but you marry my my sister, who's your somehow distant cousin. Suddenly, you're my brother-in-law, basically, right? If I'm just thinking this through concretely, so suddenly, if someone I'm I've got a lot greater commitment to do something. Ah, uh, you know, your children are going to be my nieces and nephews, and so just to think this through. So if I if someone gets murdered in my family, my my brother gets murdered. Suddenly, it's your brother-in-law, not some person right. three. I don't know. Your cousin nephew of cousin. might have the responsibility to avenge that death, for example. That's right. It. And also in terms of business, if we're going to go into farming together or something, I can trust you basically in a way that I possibly couldn't trust you or right. vice versa before. Is that is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Trust sharing, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to screw you over on some contract, all those kinds of things. And so we've been brought closer and then we can we can do business more easily. Um, because we have that trust. And so the, the marriage bond helps do that. And it, then it, you have that for a while, right? But a couple of generations later, now we're further apart than we, we used to be. Used to be. But they're still we cousins, so we do another cousin marriage and we're pulled back together. Got it. Now, I just want to flag thing. And I'm, I'm obviously, well, you also have an economics background, but these are public goods problems, classic, like de collective defense, trading. Th these are things where there's positive sum outcomes. If we can all bond together to fight, um, and people know that this is the point and people know that they won't come and kill us. Because, you know, we won't even have to avenge a murder because we, they'll know we're powerful or if it does happen, we'll be able to do something about it. And similarly, trade or other mutual enterprise is a classic positive sum game, but which is vulnerable to the prisoner's dilemma or defection, which is vulnerable to we work together on the field. I don't know. I shirk and don't do my part or I we go off to trade at a market and I come back and tell you that actually I didn't, I sold it for half what I actually sold it for or all the other ways that we can mess each other around um, in life. But the core is obviously defense. I mean, and, you know, warfare. So just what you're telling me, if I put it in a nutshell, is that one way to solve um, public goods problems of a kind or collective action problems is through a kinship networks which build these relationships of trust and basically solve the defection problem. I mean, in the crudest public, if I'm, if I'm your brother and we're both arrested by the DA for that heist at the local bank, it's much less likely that either of us are going to rat on the other one in the, in the prisoner's dilemma. And right. crudely put, if you're my cousin, even it becomes less likely, or if you've married my wife's sister or whatever. And so this is one way that human societies um, scale in the face of these public goods problems. And, and what you also said is that culturally and historically, we've also put a lot, it's not just that we do kinship, there's a whole bunch of norms, religion, other things that reinforce and support these systems of behavior and why I should treat you know, my extended family a certain way. Right. Now, what the, so, so a couple of important things about that though. One is, as best we can tell, this is the first way that people tried to solve collective action problems. So right. by taking advantage of these family ties, 
we have a little bit of it because of genetic altruism to close relatives. The culture basically said, let's really take advantage of that and figure out all ways to bolster that up and create cross-cutting ties, multiple ties, shared incentives, putting people together so they grow up together through these residence rules, different ways of taking advantage of that to make that unit you know, cooperative and trustworthy and to solve all those public goods problems. But then the thing is, when you want to go to a higher level and you need to go super family to get big groups and stuff like that, all those super family structures, the institutions, have to deal with the fact that they're evolving in a world that already is built around kinship. So like a typical legal system might take advantage of the bond between father and son. If the son commits a crime, they put the father in jail. Now that sounds really weird to us, but it made perfect sense in, in former times and in other places. And the, the father would have to stay in jail until the son showed back up to, to pay for his crime, right? And that didn't seem like a big problem to, to lots of in people in lots of societies. Right. And, but, and the thing just to flag is though there's some limit to the scaling of that model in, in a um particularly in a more horizontal way, maybe we could put it. I mean, one way to scale it, which you we mentioned in the last episode, is you kind of you 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 have an elite stacked on top of a basically enslaved or peasant population and in, inside of the peasant population you have these kinship networks and the elites kind of sit on top with a kind of military or something like that and they kind of run an empire and that's sort of kind of a vertical model that you can scale um to some to some extent it, that just to emphasize there there seem historically to have been a bunch of inefficiencies of those models um even back in like ancient greek times you know the famous story that you know the free the free greeks i mean Obviously, there were a load of slaves, but free Greeks defeated, you know, Xerxes and the Persians or whatever it was, um, you know, you don't fight in the same way in a, you know, imperial army as you do in a, in a free army or whatever the story would be. But just to say, so let's now come, the point is there's some limit to the, that kind of scaling of a kind. Now, the, what we're saying is that the weird route, the, 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 the Catholic Church start us down some different alternative because you eliminate this whole way that humans have evolved to build trust to uh, have extended allies to navigate the world you said to self-insure you know who's going to look after me in my old age or if i get disabled or all these things and i also want to check so it started out with this program of banning cousin marriage but ban banning marrying my you know my wife's sister polygyny uh we actually haven't mentioned we should come to that in a moment actually um what j just to say this wasn't the intention of the church to start anyone down a different cultural evolutionary path right i just want to emphasize is that right it's just the church just they almost like chant the catholic church just kind of came on this almost by accident because of ritual or other rules within that you know they decide this was a good idea is that right yeah i mean as best we can tell i think that's right I mean, there could be, there's interesting historical debates to have, have about this because like St. Augustine of Hippo has a famous quote where he seems to recognize that some of these cousin rules have some positive social effects. But as far as we know, that wasn't like a key agenda item in all the subsequent centuries where they were making these rules. People seem to believe that God wanted, that God had a problem with um, cousin marriage and that it was, and that if they, people didn't obey these taboos, that bad stuff would happen, like plagues would show up. And whatnot. So they saw it as very much a way of satisfying God. Whether there were some church leaders who might have recognized this is, is a possibility. But I think that the important picture here, and this is something that's easy to miss from the way we think about things, is you want to zoom out and recognize that lots of different religions have rules about family structure. Right. And some of them have disappeared into history, uh, and like Zoroastrianism, and others have proliferated and become very successful. So I think that different religions will just try different stuff, and people often believe that's how God wants it. And depending on what the downstream effects of those rules are, they could have no effect if they're, you know, if they're minor, but they could, like this set of rules, have a big effect on the trajectory of that society. Um, so. One last one I just want to check in is polygyny. We haven't talked about that. Just what is polygyny? Just for people listening, I had to read, when I read in your book, I had to you know, learn clearly what it was. And why is that, again, important in maintaining kinship uh, or clan structures? Just yep. brief. So quick uh, anthropological background. So polygamy contains two different kinds of things. One is polygyny, which sounds like polygamy, but isn't, is you know, a subset. That's when uh, males have multiple wives, so more than one wife at the same time. There's also polyandry, 
where a woman can have multiple husbands. That turns out to be very rare in the anthropological record. So, I mean, estimates vary, but something like less than 0.1% of societies have that. Although it may, it does appear at quite low levels at, in some societies. And uh, so, but lots of societies, men have multiple wives, typically high status males will have multiple wives. 85% of societies in the anthropological record have this. And uh, that just means that you can have these really large family networks where, you know, if your father has multiple wives, you have all these half siblings. And, you know, you, those ha you have responsibilities to those half siblings. You're not as close as you are to, the, to, to your full sibs, which, you know, has many stories about succession and conflict within royal families and stuff have to do along those cleavages. But nevertheless, it does mean you have a big family and, and you're, you're a bigger clan than you would be otherwise. So again, just the key point is that polygyny, when, when a man has multiple wives, it, it allows us to kind of knit much larger family clan networks together. And I, I just also want to remark that you just said that 85% of societies in the, the historical anthropological record we have, have that. That's so right. just for listeners, that like tells us, because like obviously in, in weird societies, that is not allowed. I think just to mention example, I think it's a Charlemagne in your book, you mentioned like Charlemagne getting in trouble or something like someone like the church actually having some major fights with like powerful men. Can you, are there any examples from the early medieval period you want to mention of that? Where Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Charlemagne, I think he had 10 wives. Um, you know, it took a long time for the church to kind of keep pushing back against concubinage. So there's there was a couple different systems. One is you have wives who are roughly equal social status. And then in Europe, they also had like a secondary wife situation where you'd have a primary wife who was the same social status as you. And then you would take these secondary wives, they call them concubines, is the historical term for it. But it would it effectively, I mean, those children would often have inheritance rights. It was a socially recognized relationship, um, but it was someone from a lower socioeconomic status. So, you know, the church was totally against that. And finally, one of the tools they used was this, the concept of the bastard. So they made the children of these secondary wives have no inheritance rights and not, no rights within the church and whatnot. So that made those marriages a lot less interesting to women and also to men, but especially to women. Uh, and then that began to push push back on that and began to reduce the frequency of those. But this was this was very common throughout Europe. Yeah, I mean, people should check in on their Game of Thrones here for some of some of these kind of things showing up. So what's crucial is like you're saying. A, there's a lot of demand for polygyny among high status males and others for a variety, variety of obvious, perhaps genetic reasons. But basically, the church really pushed on this as an example of something, and it's something really rare in the historical anthropological record. That's okay. Now let's pass what. So, what happens? So, if we're thinking of this, and I just want to, like, for myself, share, like, you know, you can think of genetics. We've got some new strain. You'd think of some new strain of the virus. You know, everyone's familiar with COVID now, but this, you know, I don't know, Omicron strain. We've got some new cultural strain here, which is really unusual in the historical record in basically eliminating many of the tools used to create large clan or family networks. You've removed all of this support. You've snipped, if you like, snipped away all these supports that a, a human being would have in the world. And so what's going to start happening and what do, what can we document? And maybe here you want to, yeah, like what, what start do we think starts happening? Yeah, so the, my picture of this is that because you're losing this family as a core structure, people are looking for ways to create, um, the, I mean, one of the first problems you have to solve is this kind of mutual aid problem. So what happens when you get sick or old? Who's going to take care of your children if you if you break your leg or something like that? So people use religion, and so they become even more enthusiastic about being members of the church, and they use these religious, uh, the religious connections to build religious communities in which they basically self-insure each other. So we're all going to get together in this small town or in this community, and we all swear to God that if anything happens to the others, that we'll be there, and we'll support them and help them and, and whatnot. So they form these self-help societies, which are really the beginnings of guilds. Now, eventually those become occupational and the occupational guilds perform the same function. So all the bakers will take care of the other bakers. Um, but at least in the beginning, they were just they just started as pure self-help societies. And you get the spread of monasteries, which start doing the same thing and become self-governing. And eventually some of the monasteries try elected leaders. And so you have the beginning of the use of voting in elections. 
universities are a kind of voluntary association that pops up. And then these small charter towns where people will get together to start a town or a Duke might want to start a town because of the, the profits, but then they have this kind of self-insuring defense thing. So they'll all agree that every, every able-bodied man must show up in defense of the town. They'll help on community projects. We need to build a wall or something. And they'll you know, have to donate your labor as a member of the community. The notion of citizenship at the town level starts up. But these are things where you volunteer to become a member. So you're not a member by birth, which is the, the old model, the kinship model. I mean, so this just, I, I, I want to kind of keep having you share, Joe, just how like radically different from the historical record, because we live in it, like it, like we kind of bathe in it. It's like the water we, or at least you and I, because we're both from Western societies, walk in. Um, it's just like how different in the historical record. And just to emphasize here, the point here is that these are often horizontal connections. In the church, I'm basically, or with bakers, I'm a, a kind of relative peer. Of course, there's differentiations and there's hierarchy to some extent in the church, but in the congregation, in, in the charter town, in, in many other places, these are horizontal associations, whereas there had been support, but many of the other associations, while there was some horizontality, were often vertical, father to son, you know, whatever the structures were, they were much more vertical. Um, so this is really like novel. I think there's one point in your book where you really strike me where, because there's this kind of story I want to also kind of come to, which is, you know, what you're answering also in this book is why the West, right? The first book is like, why sapiens? Why did sapiens make it versus the Neanderthals? This great historical question. Second book, which is a big chestnut, is like, why did the West, why, why you know, and, and there's a classic story, which is like in 1000 AD, you know, you, or 1100 AD, you survey around the world, you look at, you know, the Chinese, China, you look at um, the Islamic empires, you look, you look at Western Europe and like, like Western Europe is like backward and, you know, poor and, you know, warring and tiny and underpopulated. How on earth would it succeed? And I want to bring out here one statistic. I think I remember the book and you know, you'll have it to mind, but it's like, even by like 1100 or something, like the number of charter towns, the number of towns with autonomous kind of governance in Western Europe, like outstripped anywhere else in the world. Is that right? I can't remember the exact figure. Yeah, I mean, the, yes. Something like that. I mean, in the Islamic world, there were zero. So <laughs> well, it didn't take much by 1100. There were certainly more of these kind of autonomous governing towns. And, and so, in China, so what I'm trying to say is that what, like an exponential curve, while things were kind of hidden, there was already this kind of source by like 1000 AD or 1100 AD of a completely different model um, that, that you, you know, in this story then has this potential, even if it seems backward at the time. Right. So what, um, so in a way, like the church chants on this, we've got this different, like, you know, threat, like di different um, strain of the virus, the different cultural evolutionary tree where we've illuminated the normal things that will support you. People therefore form these horizontal networks. Um, what impact and then sorry then we're going to come what about pro, i mean you started but you talked also about protestantism and about reading and other things so what else what else happens in the west that like even builds on this or even accelerates this further what other cultural evolutionary changes happen yeah so you have the the dissolving of the complex kinship structures in the monogamous nuclear families and then the beginnings of these voluntary institutions and then you have getting these charter towns setting up. And then the question is, how do you govern these places that are full of people who are joined as voluntary members? And that includes the charter towns and the monasteries and the guilds and stuff. So there's a kind of competition among these groups to attract the, the best, the best of whatever they can attract. Maybe it's the best merchants, could be the best blacksmith, whatever. Um, and part of this has to do with giving people citizens rights, what we now think of as individual rights, but of course these would have been confined to the town. Uh, and it could have been like um, a freedom from impressment or freedom from certain taxes or, you know, uh, some kind of voting uh, opportunity in some legislative body that elects elected leaders. And so, you know, some towns adopted this and then those towns were often copied if they were successful. And so you get this gradual flow and movement of different ways of governing an organization. Uh, and so you begin to get the emergence of representative governments where citizens get rights and, you know, this is affecting who jo who joins what town and whatnot. Um, and you also, this along with this is the emergence of Western law. So a law where the individual is the primary uh, uh, holder of, 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 well, I guess, holder of rights essentially, but although the notion of rights is kind of a new idea. Right. 
and um, a lot of the features of Western law begin to get developed, like the importance of mental states. Did, did you kill them on purpose or did you kill them by accident? Didn't always matter in lots of societies. And in the West, this became very fine grained where there were lots of different elements to the, to the mental states. Did you know that what you were doing was going to hurt the person? Did you want to hurt the person? All of these different features, which you don't see in lots of other legal systems. Uh, and then eventually you get to the Protestantism, which I think has like flare ups long before Martin Luther appears. On yes. The scene. But this, this kind of very individualistic religion that is very mental state based is just the continuation of the trajectory that was occurring in lots of domains of life. So can we just say a bit more just for a moment again about how unusual or weird is you just said that we have Western law where there's the individual. So just to put us in the shoes of many other societies, maybe even today or in the past, you don't have this concept of individual having rights or responsibilities. It would be, you talked about like the family, like I put the father in jail. But can you just describe those two different worlds a little bit? Like what would, what would be a classic traditional legal system? You know, untreatment of murder, for example, the, or, or, the, the or legal student. unit, right? The legal unit is not the person; it's some sort of kin group. It might be the clan. Um, a lot of the law has to do with negotiations among the clan. So in China, you know, you, you have these courts that would adjudicate problems, but they're not trying to figure. They're not trying to uh, engage in justice. They're trying to mitigate conflict between kin groups. So they get the leaders of each clan there, and they have a an adjudication negotiation process. And it's an effort to make both clans happy enough so that they stop with whatever the conflict is, as opposed to, you know, trying to establish some set of facts and, and you know, protect the rights of the individual and follow the law. It's very much not that kind of thing. And it's also taking into account the relationships between people. So for a, a simple example would be, you know, if a son does punches his father, it's a much worse crime than if a father punches his son, say two adults. Um, so relationships matters in how you're judging things. The same thing would matter with the relationships between the clans if they're connected. The nature of how bad a crime is depends on how they're connected. And if they're close enough, then they're supposed to deal with it internally. So the legal system often did even deal with internal, internal disputes. Um, so those are some of the differences. And, and then the mental states is a, is a big one that you see in lots of places where if you burn someone's house down, it doesn't matter whether you did it on purpose or, or by accident. It just matters that the, their house was destroyed and the damage to them is the same so a lot of times the legal penalties and whatnot are the same so just to emphasize that last point which is i think very interesting about our conception both of individuals but also justice or how we is that the intention matters so in most systems just the damage happened or the person got killed it didn't matter whether you intended to kill them whatever whereas you're saying in the western system it starts to become very important what your intention is and I guess just that would show up in religion as well a lot, right? You'd say the Protestantism is the kind of like, you know, the extreme. In, in many systems, it doesn't matter whether I, what I intended towards God. If I've gone and done the observances, if I've gone and done the rites or the rituals, it doesn't matter. Whereas, you know, what Martin Luther is saying is like, almost it doesn't matter whether you're going and going to church and doing all the right stuff. If you, if you don't have the right faith, if you don't have the right thing in your heart, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so this is the notion that it's, it's very intuitive to, to lots of weird people, but the notion that it's about faith, that it's about this internal mental state that you really believe in God, in a sense. Um, in lots of traditions, it's just about whether you do the rituals and you go along with the practices and you follow the food taboos and whatnot. And this, this notion of what everybody's internal individual mental state is, isn't a big issue that's widely discussed. And Martin Luther went so far as to say, the only thing that matters is faith. Right. This is the big debate about good works and faith or just faith. And a lot of Protestant sects had, you know, it's faith alone that matters. Whereas the church mm -hmm. was, more, was less uh, inclined towards mental states because they thought your actions actually matter. And this is very unusual. OK. And so I want to then. I mean, then just a one last example I mean, you bring up to be in the book is of ways that cultural evolution then leads to actual major changes in psychology with protestantism reading the bible becomes really important isn't is that right that's right so do you want to say a little bit about that and its impact on on our on our cognition or our, on our societies you know yeah yeah this is one of those interesting cultural mutations that had a big effect but n nobody knew at the time or didn't anticipate all the effects it would have so 
because of the importance of mental states and the importance of the individual, many Protestant groups came to believe that each person, men and women, should read the Bible for themselves in order to develop their own personal relationship with God. And this is very strange. Like, you know, oftentimes an entire group will have a relationship with the deity and the kind of rank and file members don't think of themselves as having an individual relationship with the deity. It's a personal relationship the way lots of Protestants think about the relationship with God. Uh, so in order to get this, it was thought that all children should learn to read so they could read the Bible, so they could have their own views about this and then develop their personal relationship with God. So their educational programs and family practices and all began to teach all children how to read. But then, of course, once you know how to read the Bible, you can read lots of other stuff. And so this creates this whole market for books and, and learning to read actually changes your brain. You get a thicker corpus callosum, you process information differently. Um, you get a little, worse, a little worse at face processing potentially. And um, so there are these interesting downstream effects. And it may be that this created, you know, some have argued this led to the second industrial revolution because in Germany, for example, there were high rates of literacy when everybody was just farmers. But as soon as there was an opportunity where that literacy could be put to work, it was put to work. And, you know, this, this allowed the economy to grow faster than it otherwise would have because there was this latent reservoir of, of literate people. I mean, just to emphasize this again, I think what's very interesting about this, to go back to a story we had last time is, you have sometimes chicken and egg problems, or we could say it's like, um, you know, in, in genetic fitness, or even cultural evolutionary fitness, there's this problem of getting through a valley to get to another peak. So you know, you're at peak here, there's another peak higher up, but between there's a valley, there's no way to get to that higher valley. And just to take an example there, yeah, like it's really obvious to us that literacy is really valuable, but as people realize in Western, you know, even today, it's very costly to learn to read. It takes a lot of time and effort um, that certainly if you notice with children, they're not always actually default enthusiastic about. <laughs> um, my wife also, my partner is Taiwanese, you know, it, learning to read Chinese is like a really intensive effort over many years of rote instruction on the characters and so on sometimes or whatever it is, you know. Um, this what you just said there is like there's suddenly this moment when it's going to be useful and particularly i think it's another example where it's kind of being literate on your own isn't going to be very, you know by almost definition isn't useful because you need books it, it's something like language where you need to interchange so you just get this point that somehow to get to this other valley where we where had like a large literate pool of population or a large more educated pool there was no motivation at the beginning. It wouldn't have been that there was like an economic motivation because there wouldn't have been a lot of books, et cetera. But there was this incredible um, drive culturally. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, this was an area I was interested in, you know, these descriptions of the plow boy is going to teach himself, you know, he's tired, but he's going to learn to read because he needs to read God's word. There's this, this incredible motivation to do something that will then turn out to have this huge public good effect that you're right. describing, or this collective effect later on. Um, and it, it's a nice example of the power of religion to kind of create these unexpected conditions. Uh, one of the things I don't spend much time on, it's, it's explained in a footnote uh, in my, where I discussed this Protestant literacy, but that the other time we know that this happened was uh, after the destruction of, this, of the Second Temple in, in 70 yes. CE, uh, Judaism becomes, goes from a religion of the temple, there's no temple now, uh, to a religion of the book where all Jewish men need to learn to read the Torah um their holy script yeah, their holy book in um in hebrew and so they jewish men start becoming literate and then this has downstream uh it opens up opportunities for them in urban occupations because you have this whole group of literate men who can then go on to become accountants and do all kinds of urban populations and they've already done the hard work of, of learning to read at least one language so it's easier to learn to read the next language right um so I think one thing I just want to touch on, and it's difficult to do in a podcast, but I just want to emphasize to readers, and maybe you could share a little bit, is the array of statistical, you know, like I think really you know, kind of clever, I want to use that in the most positive sense, statistical work that you do to back this up. This isn't just a hypothesis. What's incredible in, in the book, in the work, is that you're able to kind of correlate exposure to this marriage and family program of the church to kind of cultural, particularly psychological effects, but ultimately therefore culture 
a thousand years later, I mean, today, basically, I mean, do you want to briefly summarize, you know, one or two examples of that, what that means, like, you know, what we can statistically correlate, you know, like, to give a sense to people, this is not just like a hypothesis, it's something with really, some really strong statistical basis behind it as well. Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is work I did with uh, Jonathan Schultz, um, and some co-authors, some economist co-authors. And uh, what we did is we got the database of um, the spread of bishoprics throughout Europe. And what we have with each of the bishoprics is a date when it was founded and then a GPS location. And this allows us to take for, you know, each plot of land in Europe to say how long the people who live there have been under the influence of the Roman Catholic Church as captured by the diffusion of these administrative centers called bishoprics. Uh, and, you know, there's this, you know, you can, you can plot a map and you can show how the bishoprics spread. Sometimes areas, say Spain uh, or southern Italy, are, are conquered by uh, powers hostile to the bishop in Rome, the pope. So we don't count those years when you're, when you're not connected to the, to the papal church, to the, the center of Catholicism. Uh, and then we can use the number of years that each plot of population has been under the church to then say things about contemporary psychology. So we have these vast surveys of hundreds of thousands of Europeans in the modern world, and we can get measures of trust and fairness and individualism and conformity from those surveys. And then what we can show is that there's a strong relationship between the number of years under the church and being less conformist or more individualistic or more trusting in strangers. We can also get measures of cousin marriage in the 20th century and show that the more years under the church, the less cousin marriage you have. So that's consistent with, with the basic idea of the mechanism, which is this family stuff. And we can also link the cousin marriage to the psychological traits. So we can, we can try to connect all these different dots. And surprisingly, I mean, given the depth of this historical data, uh, the, the results are quite strong. Right. And I mean, this... I think is incredible evidence. I mean, and something only possible really in the last, funnily enough, in the last 20, 30 years, because we just didn't have the databases, the richest, the psychological databases. We probably didn't have the Bishop database digitized, available to do these regressions um, in. Of what you, I think you use this term, I've used, I think maybe I even borrowed it from you. I don't know, a colleague of mine a few years ago, I don't know where it was coming from, but the dark, what you call the dark matter of history. I think this is a fantastic term, um, which is that as in physics, we have this dark matter problem. I mean, just for, for people who are not familiar, this idea that, hey, our galaxy, without there being a load of matter, we can't see something's not right about our cosmological models. Our galaxy should be moving apart faster than it is or the universe. So there's this invisible matter that explains a lot of stuff in physics. And similarly, I think what you, this work, this incredible work you and colleagues have been doing is pointing to this dark matter of history, the culture that we've, we kind of feel is important, but we haven't been able to document. Do you want to say a little bit about them? You have a chat at the end of your book. I think this is like a subtitle. What, what do you mean by that and the vision of that in like what we could start to see or what we're seeing and what, what else you see is out there? Yeah, so the, the dark matter is meant to capture these uh, culturally influenced features of psychology, like an emphasis on the individual um, or this dispositionalism, thinking of individuals as imbued with these internal traits or the trust in strangers. And the idea was that, you know, that this may have been created by these family structures and, you know, these institutions, but this then affects the things that historians see like law. So Western law, as we talked about, is unusual in being individual focused. And you might think, well, people just finally got sensible or something like have some kind of rational explanation that this is a, the best way to do things. I think the reason they do that law is because they think they think in a particular way, but we can't see them thinking. Right. Because that's, that's why it's dark matter. But they're, but they're individualists and they have strong individualism psychology and they think about dispositions. So they want to assign rights to people. That's this hidden thing inside of people from which we explain why we should do this law or this law or do that. Um, so you can, it, it's manifesting in what historians can see, but the psychology in the background is why one population does one set of things and why another population does another set of things. So I think there are two parts just to draw out of that. I think they're really interesting about that. One is that, that often it's hidden from our view, but it's hidden from people's view themselves. We, we have this, I think you, you, part of your work is also this kind of, there's been a kind of view that somehow 
we were the smart monkey optimizing. Like we've, we've designed things because they were a good idea. And part of the story of this is almost we just hit on things by accident that worked. Often we don't even realize that they're working or why they work. We don't understand why we're uh, processing this particular you know, type of yam in a particular way, but actually it's getting rid of the cyanide or whatever it is it's doing. Similarly, we don't, Luther's just saying, you've got to read the Bible or people are deciding that. It's not they're like, oh, well, then this will lead to a literate population that one day will allow us <laughs> to do X or Y. But then there are these, so what's visible is then law, but even other things, number of patents, how innovative, the form of capitalism, whatever, all these things. But behind that are, are these, these psychological mechanisms. But I also, you just said that's the kind of dark matter, but there's also even the level behind that, which is the culture, which has often been invisible. I mean, right. we don't, we, we have a lot of difficulty tracking what are the views and values of people a thousand years ago, let alone compared to today. Yeah. So traditionally culture has been extremely difficult to, to study in its, in its, in that sense of what exactly are people's, you know, we, if we go and interview them, we can find out, but you know, people's books. I mean, that's what people wrote in their notebook 800 years ago. It's a tiny sample of the population, blah, blah, blah. So there's this double level of it. And I think the big story here is that like the story of physics, that, oh, that is actually way more important possibly than the things that we focused on. Right that's what i'm hearing you say like we've often focused on you know the great men or the great women of history you know this or that invention but in fact there's this huge subterranean current or flow or whatever metaphor of culture and psychology that is driving these other things or enable labeling them to happen yeah and uh i mean one of the ways i try to make that point is a lot of scholars like to trace things to the enlightenment. So this is when, you know, the European intellectuals finally start to crystallize some of these ideas. But something like human rights, as I mentioned, you can you can follow the trail of human rights back into the high Middle Ages as towns began to establish these rules they used to attract citizens to their town. Um, you know, so then they're thinking of them as rights. And there's a couple there that you eventually see later in the Bill of Rights and things like that. So there's this long, centuries-long process of developing these ideas. And then, you know, some guys in the Enlightenment kind of crystallize and write it down, but it's part of this train of things that's been discussed for, for centuries prior to that. And so they're very much just the, the, the people on the spot when, you know, um, uh, you know, national government started to change and become democratic, for example. And I just want to riff on something there maybe as a slight irony, which is one of the points also in, in your and others' work is that humans have a tendency to agency, agentism, if you like, right? We tend to like, you know, we want that, you know, it's raining because the God is making it rain. We have this tendency to anthropomorphize or to agentize the world, I think, is a way. And just as you're saying, in history, we have a tendency to want, you know, we want to, we, we know about Voltaire or we'll focus on Hitler or some other great, you know, good or bad figure rather than the underlying currents and, and changes because that is easier for our brain somehow to cognize about. Yeah. And one of the points I try to make with thing, people like Voltaire is they're, you know, they're thinking with weird psychology, right? So they have, um, they're analytic thinkers. They're breaking things down into uh, parts and they're, they're assigning properties and they're, um, uh, thinking about individuals as, as an important loci, you know, but there's, so, but this is this piece of psychology that has been evolving for centuries. Okay. So I want to like wrap up a little bit, this part two section to say, so what we've seen in part one, we're the cultural species in part two, we've seen a concrete um, example of cultural evolution acting. There was a variant of the virus, if you like, in, in, in this moment, very unusual variant, in the early church, Catholic church, marriage and family program. And that operated over centuries to break down traditional uh, clan and family networks, the way that traditionally most societies have operated to scale. And instead these horizontal connections came up. And with that came a whole different ways of seeing the world, more individualistic, more actual trusting of strangers, um, et cetera. And, that further accelerated with Protestantism and other things and, and in, in the Western world led to some very un, being very unusual psychological traits. And those traits which perhaps underlie and explain some of the dramatic 
economic, you might say, success of the West, maybe now a problematic success, a runaway capitalism, a runaway uh, society, but at least for a period extremely, um, you know, led to democracy, innovations in technology and all these kind of things.